After the battles of Radka, late summer is lovely weather for campaigning. There are city improvements in Krasny and Wilhelm, Berdain, and Cass and Osrak, Trentus, and Benota, West Thuiba. The city of Adon has fallen from royalist control to that of the Burgundii. General Camembert of the Royalists has led his force of militia against a loyalist militia brigade, destroying them and capturing Rauchkaiser. General Pigafetta has led a royalist and West Thuiban mercenary force against the loyalist fort at Siegel. The fort has fallen to a short siege, and the Cheese Company mercenaries of Burdain have accepted terms of surrender. The mercenaries are to abandon their weapons and leave Maustria permanently. General the Countess Penella has arrived at Milbukaiser to find the city held against her by a royalist fort. The Crimsonian army of Black Cheddar has pursued Penella, capturing the city of Prat Platkov and installing a royalist Maustrian governor en route. Massive celebrations in Berdain as many new ships of war are launched. Baron Gamelost has led the main royalist army through the Bergkaiser and then west to engage Decimaus's loyalist corps, with General the Count Gudarian present. The scene is set for a serious battle in the heart of Maustria. West of the Bergkaiser, the Marquis Decimaus has decided to lay a trap for the pursuing royalist forces. Outnumbered but eager, the loyalists choose to give battle at the river crossings near Dimmersdorf. The plan is to allow the royalists to cross part of their forces at either the Smelbrook or Tresbrook, then counterattack, cutting them off and destroying them. It is a solid strategy, but the elements have not been made exactly clear to all the sub-commanders. Near Tresbrook, the loyalists have deployed on both sides of the river, and their strength can clearly be seen, rather than hiding behind the hill. And at Smelbrook, similarly, the loyalist troops are in the open, observable to any royalist scouts. The royalists are advancing on three roads, and shortly after 9am the two sides see each other. At about 10 o'clock, the Loyalist 3rd Division has almost completely crossed back over the Tresbrook, but a brigade of cavalry are caught by the Royalists, who charge home. The Loyalist cavalry breaks and flees across the bridge, but are not destroyed, and the guns on the hill open fire on the Royalist cavalry division. At Smelbrook, the advancing Royal infantry observe the enemy cavalry and form up in lines of battle. At both bridges, the Royal forces decide against attacking such strongly held positions. The Loyalist trap has failed. But there is a third royal column on the left, advancing to what is known locally as the Melwood Ford. It is a wider section of the river, and locals suggest it can be crossed, with difficulty, at certain times of the year. This being late summer, it is not impossible. At 11 o'clock, the royal troops discover it is possible. The water is low, and all kinds of units can cross. Out of character for a moment, I rolled a d6 to see, and waited for the first unit to enter the water to roll. On a roll of 5 plus, both infantry and cavalry could cross without difficulty. The Loyalists only have one brigade of infantry guarding the ford, and suddenly this trap for the Royalists is turning into a battle of manoeuvre. It takes time for the news about the Melwood Ford to reach both army commanders, and the Royalists have massed their forces opposite Smelbrook and Tresbrook. But by one o'clock the royal army is moving to their left. Small contingents are left to guard the bridges, while the vast majority of forces are marching to Melwood Ford. And by 2pm the loyalist army have matched the move, with most of the forces at Tresbrook marching to Melwood Ford to face the flanking royalists. At this point Decimus could have simply retreated his army to the west, top of the screen in these images, but decides that the time is ripe for a final battle. And if he can get most troops to Melwood Ford first, his plan of smashing a portion of the Royal Army can work. The Loyalist Brigade guarding the fort is overwhelmed by infantry and cavalry attack, and more of Royal troops are streaming towards the crossing point. A serious firefight erupts as Loyal troops from Smelbrook arrive in time to contest the flank. On the other flank at Tresbrook, the Royalist artillery have succeeded in silencing the Loyalist guns on the hill, at least temporarily, and the local commander orders his troops across the bridge. This is really a sideshow of the main battle. Neither side has the reserves necessary to gain a significant advantage. The back and forth will continue all afternoon. At the ford, Royalist fire forces the Loyalist regulars to retreat, so they send forward their guards brigade to hold the line. The Royalists counter by committing their heavy cavalry along the riverbank. There is a great charge, and the heavies roll up the Loyalist line until they are finally repulsed by another brigade of guards. The Loyalist division is exhausted and begins to retreat towards the big wheat field in the villages of Goss and Preta. By 4pm, 
Decimaus and the Loyalist forces from Tresbrook have arrived on the Melwood Ford flank, but instead of outnumbering the enemy and crushing the crossing, they find themselves more than equally matched and forced to form a defensive line from Goss to the Pretach Hill. The Royalists are gathering their strength and attacking. And it's Melbrook. The royal troops, under the watchful eyes of young King Sivka, launch an attack in face of Loyalist artillery and musketry. The attack is doomed to disaster, but is saved in the nick of time by the arrival of royal troops marching from the ford. Smelbrook is taken just after 5pm. On the Goss to Pretach Hill line, there are many acts of gallantry as both armies charge and countercharge and batter each other to pieces. The village of Goss changes hands many times. There are moments when it seems the Royalist lines cannot take any more and are forced to fall back. At about 5pm, the Loyalist cavalry launch a flanking charge from the west upon a unit of disordered Royal heavies and are defeated and shattered, and the force of will seems to go out of the Loyalist troops. Royal cavalry make their way around Goss and threaten the Loyalist line of retreat to the west. The Loyalist forces are increasingly surrounded, and with the loss of Smelbrook, fresh Royalist troops are marching on this position. At just after 6pm, as Decimaus is giving orders for a breakout to the northwest, Gudarian overrules him. The old count has been present all day, adding his gravitas to Decimaus's enthusiasm and passion. It is enough. I have lost. He orders the remaining brigades to cease fire, and rides out to meet the royal commander in the field. The battle at the Dimmersdorf crossings, also called the Battle of the Twin Bridges, resulted in a royalist victory. General the Count Gudarian has called for a ceasefire in terms of surrender. It is believed the Loyalist forces have lost some 10,000 soldiers, killed, wounded and missing. The Royalists have lost some 8,000. Although this battle will spell the end to the main Loyalist resistance to King Sivka, Decimaus orders his most fanatical troops to break out to the north and west overnight, refusing to accept that Gudarian has surrendered the cause. The campaign continues.